Well, welcome to the final session of the Communities Choice Track on the second day of the MDF 2020 conference. My name is Kay Hayes and I'm the Colorado Support Group Facilitator. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Kathleen Bogart and Dr. Katie Eichinger, who will be discussing mental health in the context of rare disease and COVID-19. And boy, oh boy, do we need to hear what they know. <laughs> Dr. Eichinger is a physical therapist and assistant professor at the University of Rochester, where she's involved in the clinical care of individuals with adult and pediatric neuromuscular conditions. She's involved in natural history studies and clinical trials involving patients with myotonic dystrophy and other neuromuscular diseases. Dr. Kathleen Bogart is an assistant professor of psychology and director of the Disability and Social Interaction Lab at Oregon State University. As a person with a rare disorder, she is passionate about researching, researching educating, advocating about quality of life with rare disorders. She served on the American Psychological Association Committee on Disability Issues in Psychology, the Rehabilitation Psychology Editorial Board, and the Mobius Syndrome Foundation Scientific Advisory Board. Probably didn't say that right, sorry. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Time Magazine, The Conversation, The Financial Times, and Psychology Today. Uh, Dr. Bogart, I think you're kicking us off today. Absolutely. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, um, so thank you so much for having me today. I'm learning so much about your community. I've been attending a lot of the talks and um, hearing a lot of awesome coping strategies that will only be um, kind of reinforced by uh, what I plan to say today. Um, so again, my background is that I have a rare disease myself. I was born with uh, something called Mobius syndrome. It's very different from DM, um, but I, you know, as I'll tell you, I found a lot of commonalities across uh, very diverse uh, rare diseases. So while there are lots of differences in terms of of, um, you know, medical etiologies, psychosocially, there are some universals that I found. So my own experience with rare disease uh, led me to uh, study and become a psychologist who focuses on well-being in rare disease broadly. So, um, you know, first I want to kind of talk about some of the universals that I uh, suspect exist in our communities. So um, we have a need for specialized social support. So, you know, unfortunately there's an average diagnostic di delay of seven to nine years across all 7,000 different rare disorders. Um, and two thirds of people with rare disorders feel that they do not get sufficient informational, social and psychological support through the healthcare system. So what do we mean by social support? Um, psychology actually divides it into four categories. So the first is companionship. So that would be uh, things like belonging and enjoying shared activities with others. Uh, emotional support is feeling understood and validated. Informational support is getting useful knowledge uh, about how to cope with a given situation. And tangible support is um, getting practical assistance with tasks and chores and things like that. So all four of these we believe are um, important to help us survive and cope with stress. Now, the other universal I want to focus on today is stigma. Um, by nature, rare disorders are isolating uh, because we are so geographically dispersed that we normally wouldn't encounter others like us. Um, and indeed, people with rare diseases and their families want to meet others with their condition, but most have never had the opportunity to do so. 
Um, pair that with a lack of public awareness uh, such that people who've not heard of our conditions or don't understand their nature uh, may fear uh, that we're actually contagious or um, blame us for our conditions or if they haven't heard of the condition, minimize its severity or even question its legitimacy. Um, and then as people with rare disorders, we often face a decision about whether or not to explain our condition to others, to advocate for our needs and our rights. Um, but of course, this can get exhausting and trying at times. Uh, so all of these things lead to, um, you know, some pretty challenging stigma, um, which can, you know, ultimately result in prejudice and discrimination for people with rare disorders. Um, in the largest psychology study of rare disorders, I uh, collected a sample of approximately 1,200 people with any type of rare disorder. Uh, we re recruited them through NORD and many other um, rare disease organizations. And we used um, some standardized uh, surveys created by the National Institutes of Health to assess quality of life. So we assess all sorts of different domains like mental health, fatigue, pain, um, and ability to participate socially. So this is what we found. Um, the neat thing about these surveys is that they were normed to the United States population and also to common chronic diseases. So we could make a comparison. And we found, unfortunately, but honestly, unsurprisingly, that uh, people with rare disorders had a poor quality of life in all domains compared to the general population and people with common conditions. And they especially fared poorly uh, in fatigue and physical functioning. Uh, and importantly, people with rare disorders experience more anxiety than 75% of Americans and worse depression than 70% of Americans. Uh, so this really points to a need to prioritize collective mental health support for people with rare disorders. Um, as I've mentioned, a lot of these problems are common across rare disorders um, and can be much more quickly addressed than individual medical treatments for 7,000 different rare disorders. Um, so this is really a, um, an efficient way to improve people's quality of life. And so what might some of those um, support strategies be? Well, I will give you an example from, oh, lost control on the slides for a minute. I'll give you an example from a study that I did a little while ago um, in the organization that, uh, that I volunteer for, um, whose board I serve on. Uh, so again, this is the Mobius Syndrome Foundation. This condition uh, is congenital and it results in facial paralysis and eye movement limitations. Um, and much like MDF, we hold uh, conferences where people from all over the world come to spend time together and learn from each other for a weekend. Um, and so we were interested in examining whether there were measurable benefits to attending such a conference. So uh, we sent out a survey before and after the conference occurred one year, uh, and we surveyed both people with the condition and parents of people with the condition. Uh, and half of these individuals did attend the conference that year and half of them didn't. So we had kind of a, a quasi control group there. And we had them complete some online um, surveys, standardized measures again. And we also had them just answer some open ended questions about how they felt about the conference. So first, I'm going to talk to you about their open-ended responses. Um, so the most frequent theme that came up was companionship support. Um, so one quote was, the conference is the rare place that I feel normal. I wonder if people here can relate to that as well. Um, informational support. Um, so I look forward to the research and appreciate hearing updates about the studies and surgery. Oops. Um, 
and emotional support was also an important theme. I found out there are a ton of people out there who understand me. Uh, and role models turned out to be an interesting theme as well. So a parent wrote that it was really encouraging to meet adults who have Mobius syndrome and to see the adults, the young adults and teens, knowing that our kid would be okay, that he'd grow up and be successful. And then uh, almost as if it were a reaction to this previous quote, an adult with Mobius said, I enjoy and embrace being a silent role model for parents and kids. And so uh, we also examined whether there are measurable differences in some outcomes. And indeed, we found that in adults with Mobius syndrome, they had increased uh, social comfort, reduced stigma, increased knowledge, companionship, emotional and informational support after attending the conference. And uh, in parents, they received uh, increased self-efficacy for caring for their child and their rare disease and increased knowledge. Um, so, you know, I should say that I, I think it's really interesting that, you know, I'm presenting you the, the benefits of one specific rare disease conference in the context of a different specific rare disease conference. And I would be really interested to hear um, what commonalities and differences that, um, that you all as attendees are, are feeling at this point, especially given that this is our first remote offering. Um, and the last uh, study I want to talk about is actually some really exciting ongoing research that I'm doing. Um, so we wanted to expand our broad rare disease study to examine how people are doing during COVID-19. Uh, so we're actually actively collecting data here still. It's an online survey. Uh, so if you are interested in participating, you can contact me afterwards and I can link you up. So we began, we began data collection in May, and currently we have 760 participants with a variety of rare disorders. And I'm just going to tell you about some of the um, initial qualitative findings. So, you know, given the <laughs> challenging time that we're in uh, and the title of this talk, uh, I thought it would be most important to focus on some of the questions uh, regarding how people are coping and some of the uh, optimistic outcomes that people are seeing. So people generated a really nice set of coping strategies that they've been using. Um, and I would love to hear from the audience uh, what you've been using as well, if you can think of additional things that have been helping. Um, so, you know, what I will say, of course, is that not everyone felt that they were coping well. Uh, but I will say that most participants were able to give a couple of examples of things that they had found that helped. And there's a lot of variation here. There are other people who had a whole list and felt like they were, you know, really learning how to cope well. Um, so here are some of the main themes. Social support, um, you know, be that from friends, family, church, coworkers, caregivers, support groups, um, playing games online with friends, um, you know, whatever way people are able to connect, um, often virtually nowadays has been very valuable. Um, and also giving social support to others. So, you know, that can be caregiving, that can be taking care of pets. You know, so many people have gotten uh, COVID puppies to, you know, be able to spend some extra time with a, a, a warm, loving animal. Um, volunteering for organizations they care for, uh, you know, especially rare disease organizations. I thought this was a really neat idea, writing cards and mailing them to loved ones. Um, you know, of course, you're supporting the Postal Service at the same time. Uh, lots of people are engaging in mental health counseling, and of course, that can be done remotely now. Um, if people really saw value in engaging in physical activity and convening with nature as they could. Uh, so there's a whole, you know, variety of abilities here in my sample, and that included, you know, walking, yoga, even just going on the balcony and looking out onto nature, even just watch watching nature shows or going for drives. 
Um, lots of fun hobbies, art and gardening, adult coloring, uh, crochet, puzzles, you name it. Um, people are engaging in a lot of entertainment, a lot of Netflix and Hulu binges right now. Um, a lot of people specifically mentioned wanting to watch comedies. Um, and, you know, faith came up a lot in our study as well. In addition to things like uh, meditation and mantras, strategies to stay present in the moment. Uh, a lot of people have been engaging in, uh, you know, the, the practical thing of using online ordering and supply delivery or grocery curbside pickup. Um, these things have become more widely available and uh, when you know, we're at risk for COVID or simply have a disability that makes it difficult to shop. Um, these things have been excellent. Um, using a news diet. So is an excellent strategy. This means that you uh, just more intentionally consume the news so that you are aware of what's going on, but not finding yourself completely consumed and obsessed with it. So, you know, that could be deciding that you'll uh, pay attention to news 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, and pick one trusted news outlet to consume it through. A lot of people are talking about the benefits of having routine and structure and some people who are working from home or doing their education from home are engaging in that structure too. And there are a whole lot of um, different ideas around resilience, so much so that I have a few more slides that I, I want to show you to really go into that. So uh, in psychology, we define resilience as adapting in the face of adversity and maybe even coming back stronger than ever. And so some factors associated with resilience are gratitude, compassion, acceptance, and meaning. And we saw a lot of this in people's responses. Um, so people even said, you know, maybe having a rare disease makes you uniquely qualified to cope in a time like this. Um, a lot of us have already experienced isolation and avoiding uh, contagion and things like that. So people spoke to skills that they developed having a rare disease, like resourcefulness, tenacity, self-advocacy, and how they can help them during the current time. Uh, people talked about focusing on the positive and silver linings uh, and using gratitude and humor. I want to share a couple of quotes for you. Uh, my coping primarily includes awareness that my family and I are okay in this moment and trying to remain always in this moment. Uh, another quote was, change is inevitable and can be beneficial. I like to think something good can come out of it. And so the last bit of data that I want to leave you with is um, some silver linings. Um, and again, full disclosure, not everyone uh, was, you know, was in a position to think about some potential positive outcomes that could come out of the pandemic, but a few did. And I thought that these little bits of optimism uh, were nice to think about, and a good thought exercise at least. Um, so people were hoping that this would bring out more accessible policies. So people with rare disorders and disabilities have been advocating for a long time for flexibility in work and uh, work from home abilities. Uh, and you know, now with the pandemic, we're seeing that it, it is indeed possible. Um, and also people have been advocating for more telemedicine when appropriate. Uh, again, hoping that these things will continue after the pandemic. Uh, many people with rare diseases noted that uh, they feel like more people are starting to experience our normal um, and that this might help bring more empathy for people with rare diseases. Um, there's also hope for more intervention, intervention in healthcare and technology. So, for example, with um, faster vaccine development, and also um, some specific rare disorders have overlap with COVID therapies that are being developed, so that can be helpful. Um, hoping for increased respect for science and healthcare. 
uh, appreciating the ability to connect online more, um, especially given the you know, great geographic dispersal that we have as people with rare diseases. Um, and additionally, hoping that there is more normalization of presenting, preventing disease spread. So things like isolating while you're sick, um, increased hygiene and things like that. Hoping for greater ability to continue this online ordering and delivery of groceries and things like that. Uh, just believing that coming out of it, people will be stronger people. Um, and enjoying the slower pace, ability to recuperate energy, rethink priorities, and the time to be closer to friends and family. So um, in closing, you know, all of these themes really center around social support and stigma, right? So I really encourage you to be sure that all of your social support buckets are being filled. Um, so, and that you're also filling others buckets, right? So there are lots of different ways to do this. Um, conferences like we're doing right now, continuing those support groups online, serving as a mentor for people who are newer to a disease community, volunteering for those rare disease organizations. And you know, the major way to reduce stigma and also to increase the ability for people to get social support is to engage in advocacy for rare disorders and ensure that there is support and um, medical uh, and tech intervention, interventions for them. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close out my talk here. Um, if you'd like to contact me for whatever reason, um, go ahead and connect this way. And I'm going to now pass it on to Katie, who will talk about some research that she's been doing that's more specific to the DM population. Thanks, Kathleen. That was great. And thank you for allowing me to have the opportunity to share with you um, the findings of a study that we did earlier this year. And this was um, a survey that we did looking at the COVID-19 pandemic and the policies um, that were associated with it on people with muscular dystrophy. So as we've kind of discussed, um, 2020 has been definitely quite a year and COVID-19 and the associated policies um, have turned our world upside down a little bit. And given the impact that we were all feeling this spring, we were really interested to know how um, individuals with muscular dystrophies, the patient populations that we work with, were um, impacted by the pandemic as well. And this led us to develop a survey, the COVID-19 and social um, policy impact survey to understand how, how the pandemic and the, the social policies that were associated were um, impacting the patient populations. And in addition, we also used the perceived stress scale um, to assess the stress level of individuals with muscular dystrophies. Um, the survey was uh, distributed via REDCap, which is a research um, database platform with the help of many different registries and advocacy groups to individuals with self-reported um, facial scapular humeral dystrophy, myotonic dystrophy, and limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And the, the information that we'll be providing, uh, presenting on today are um, the adult respondents that lived and uh, resided in the United States. Um, we do have um, a cohort of individuals that were living in other countries that we are also um, working with um, other leaders to uh, analyze at this point, but the, the information that I'll be presenting on is the United States um, cohort. And um, also just to note the time frame, because this has been a long um, experience for all of us, the survey was open from May 8th to May 28th of 2020. This next slide goes over all the patient characteristics of all the individuals that um, completed the study. And you can see in the middle where I circled, those are the individuals with myotonic dystrophy. And for the most part, I will be gearing um, most of the data on people with myotonic dystrophy. But just to give you an overview initially, 
of um, all the participants. So there was, like I said, 774 participants um, overall. 60% um, overall were female, but you'll note in the um, category of individuals with myotonic dystrophy that actually it was 86%, almost 87% of in the individual respondents were um, female. And most individuals had genetic confirmation. Um, a fourth of the individuals um, with myotonic dystrophy reported using a wheelchair for mobility. And most of the individuals lived with other um, people. Um, and then overall, um, less than 1% of individuals reported having COVID. Um, again, this is back in, in May. Um, and from a myotonic dystrophy standpoint, only three individuals had um, had the COVID-19 uh, or co coronavirus uh, at that time. So again, the overall um, end for my tank dystrophy is 271. And like I said, that will be the, where I um, focus most of the data on. Um, overall, this is a graphical representation of all the respondents to the study. And for the most part, it follows the expect expected population densities for the United States, obviously with higher numbers in New York, California, Texas, and Florida. So we asked what challenges participants were facing during the pandemic. And this is a graphical representation of that um, with the percentages being on the vertical axis and the different categories um, on the Y axis. And so individuals were asked to mark all that applied um, in their responses. And you can see that the most frequent challenges reported were obtaining treatment, managing their stress, social distancing, and obtaining uh, essentials. Individuals were also given an opportunity to free text if they chose the other category. So in this next slide, we used a word cloud to um, just display the other challenges that people reported having during the pandemic. And you can see that work um, in all sorts of ways was one of the most commonly mentioned other challenges. So working more, working from home, work loss um, were challenges. Another big category was exercise as well. Um, and you can see other things such as finances, anxiety, depression, um, were also things that, that people were reporting um, as challenges during the pandemic. Let me ask more specifically what types of challenges um, people had due to social distancing. And again, um, the percentages on the y-axis and the um, different categories on the x-axis. And you can see here that in particularly people were feeling lonely um, and had difficulty performing their daily tasks were, were the common um, other challenges that were, or common challenges that were reported. And again, we did ask um, for other, other categories um, that people wanted to report. And here you can see, um, while some of them overlapped um, due to, so, you know, we saw mental health being um, reported here, exercise again, um, were, were written in categories for, for social distancing. And getting supplies, I think, overlaps a little bit with obtaining essentials. So what impact did, is the COVID pandemic having on muscle disease? And you can see here that um, most respondents reported that there was no change to a slightly worsening of their, their muscle disease. And this is all in, in myotonic dystrophy, although it was similar across all diseases. And you can see that, um, you know, no change to slightly worsening isn't, um, you know, probably surprising to all, all of us, given that um, muscular dystrophies are uh, chronic progressive conditions. However, um, you can, in our overall population, there were a small percentage of individuals, um, about 2%, um, in the overall group that reported that their condition had improved during the pandemic. And out of those individuals, when we looked at it more closely, those individuals reported that they had, um, they had increased their exercise, they had an improvement in their pain levels, and that they were able to manage their stress. In contrast, we also had a small percentage of individuals that um, had reported that their, their muscle disease um, was much worse. And in those individuals, 
over, over a, a little over a half um, reported that they were exercising. And then half of those individuals reported that their exercise was much less and that they had reported an increase in their pain level and, um, and that they also only a um, small amount of individuals, less than 40% reported that they were, they were able to manage their stress. So um, you can see, you know, maybe some, some themes happening in the extremes of the data, people who had noticed a great improvement and people who had noticed much worsening, um, kind of the role that pain, exercise, and stress may have been playing. To look at exercise a little bit more, um, you can see, and I, I kept all of the data for this, that um, about 65% of individuals, um, not far off the, the overall number, were exercising during the pandemic. And that um, you know, about 50% of individuals reported that their exercising had been decreasing. And certainly we know that um, access to exercise, if um, people were using gyms or pools for exercise, that was much limited as everything was closed down. Um, and, and it became more difficult. There were some individuals, I mean, people um, having a little bit more flexibility in their work schedules or a little bit more time on their hands with um, changing of activities that were able to increase their exercise during this, this time period. And then to look at pain a little bit more, 73% of individuals, which was um, pretty consistent across muscle diseases, reported pain. Um, and out of that, 30% um, uh, reported or 36% reported worsening of pain during the pandemic. And then we, that was supported by um, us asking what their pain level was prior to the pandemic and what they um, reported it um, during the pandemic. And so um, with 40, on a zero to 100 scale, zero being no pain, 100 being significant pain, um, prior to the pandemic, individuals reported that their pain was 46 on that scale. And then during the pandemic, it was being reported as close to 55. So pain, um, you know, consistently across all muscle groups was reported by most individuals. And like I said, um, most individuals reported a worsening of pain. And this slide's a little bit busy, but what this gets into is looking at um, the perceived stress um, in, of individuals by diagnosis, by sex, age, and ambulatory status. So the perceived stress scale is um, a 10 question scale where um, overall they'll have a zero to 40 scale and higher scores indicated more stress. Um, and you can see if you look at, um, this also breaks it down to typically um, low stress would be between 0 and 13, um, moderate stress between 13 and 26, and then higher stress greater than 26. And so you can see that individuals with myotonic dystrophy um, on an average scored about a 16.1 on the stress scale, so in that moderate range. You can, we also looked at the differences between groups, and really the individuals with myotonic dystrophy did have a significant um, increase in, or significant difference in stress um, by diagnosis. Um, we also see in the, the next uh, row is that gender. So individuals, um, female individuals reported more stress than male individuals. And I'll take that back to our, the diagnosis piece because when we controlled for um, the female population, if you remember back at the very beginning of, of the talk, I um, said that the individuals that re, um, responded for with myotonic dystrophy were 87% female. So when we looked um, and controlled for gender in our initial the, um, analysis where we compared the diseases, um, at that point when we controlled for first um, sex, uh, it washed out. And so there wasn't any difference between the different diseases um, when controlled for sex. And that might just indicate that the female um, cohort in the myotonic dystrophy population uh, probably played a role in, in um, the differences that we saw between the different diseases. That was a long, long explanation about that. <laughs> but um, we also looked at age and found that individuals, the younger individuals, um, individuals less than 30 years old, had the highest stress level of all um, the age groups. Um, the next was 30 to 60. And then Interestingly, individuals over 60 years of age reported the low, lowest stress level 
And um, that is consistent with um, the, the other population, the general population. So other, popu or other studies have looked at perceived stress using the same scale across um, the general population. And our findings are very similar that um, individuals of younger ages are experiencing more stress, which is a little bit interesting given that um, the initial concerns for people over 60 um, and their risk factors for having severe COVID disease um, were, were a bit higher. Um, there were no differences in stress um, for people who um, use different mobility uh, abilities. So people using wheelchairs versus people not using wheelchairs, we didn't see a, a difference in their, their stress level. Um, we also looked at um, stress management. So how were people, were people able to manage their stress and then how were they managing their stress? So 88% um, of individuals reported being able to, to manage their stress. And, and similar to um, what Kathleen pre presented is that um, mental health services, um, meditation, exercise, community support, journaling. Um, we had a lot of people reporting sleep and rest as a way of um, managing stress and coping with stress um, uh, reported. And so the highest categories you can see are sleep and rest and exercise and then meditation. And this, um, again, really supports um, kind of what Kathleen was finding in her study as well, is what are the other ways that individuals um, reported managing stress? So again, this is the other category where people could free text in what um, the ways that they were managing stress and friends and family being a huge um, category for that, those um, prayer and, and Kathleen had mentioned faith. Um, and you can see in all the smaller um, text, there's a lot of hobbies that are reported. Um, so I think it's, it's interesting that the findings are very similar. So in conclusion, um, COVID-19 has had a moderate impact um, with individuals with um, muscular dystrophy, including myotonic dystrophy. Perceived stress scores were similar to the general population and that rest, exercise, and meditation were commonly reported ways of managing stress. And then exercise, pain management, and stress management may have a positive impact on the disease. And I think as um, healthcare providers, that was um, a nice finding for us to think about how do we help and, and support our patient populations um, during the COVID pandemic. So certainly we wanna thank all of the um, survey participants um, and then all of the patient um, advocacy groups and, and registries that helped um, us distribute our survey to, to all of their um, contacts. So I think um, we'll move to being able to ask, uh, answer any questions that you may have. So I see a question being asked about, um, we did not break down uh, myotonic di dystrophy type one and type two in this study. So um, I also just wanted to acknowledge that uh, there have been some really interesting comments uh, in response to my question, what are you guys doing to cope? Uh, and, you know, we're seeing volunteer work again, uh, got a swim stall in my backyard, jealous about that. <laughs> um, learning to play chess with my son, obtained new virtual employment. I had made some good virtual friends that have also become somewhat of a virtual family and support system. Uh, watching Twitch. So, um, yeah, and I would encourage you guys to jump in with any other questions you might have. Katie, it looks like there's another one for you. Yeah, so we have considered this um, and whether or not the, you know, the survey would be pretty easy to redistribute um, and um, obviously wouldn't be able to, to um, look at the exact same participants again because all the data was de-identified when it was entered into REDCap, um, but we um, we have considered because the pandemic has been ongoing um, and people are in different states are experiencing different things um, whether or not to to send it out again. 
And uh, I'll just give a plug for my survey and say that we are collecting in an yeah. ongoing fashion. And so people at DM are welcome to. Um, and so, yeah, we've been collecting since May, so we can do some interesting time series. Things. That will be, that will be very interesting. And, and I would also be interested to, um, and I'm assuming that you're collecting this data, is to look at the geographical differences and um, how different people have experienced it based on where they've lived. Absolutely. Yeah. And this will be an international sample. So there will be some really interesting yeah. differences. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so there's a question about exercise and connection. Of people. Yeah. So from what we, we found in our survey is um, people who are exor exercising tended to report um, less. Um, they, they tended to have more improvement in their muscle disease overall than um, others. And then as connection with people as part of managing stress, again, that would be um, something that would um, hopefully positively impact their overall um, um, muscle disease. Um, and any specific exercises we didn't specifically ask, but in general, um, I think at doing whatever you can at a moderate intensity level um, as the recommendations for people with myotonic dystrophy are, um, I think that um, we have to be a little bit creative because many of us are, are actually exercising in our own um, homes at this point, or if we're in locations that can be outside, which for people in the Northeast um, at the beginning of the pandemic was very difficult, um, but we've all um, enjoyed getting out for the summertime. Um, so, so I think you just have to be creative with what you can have and, and knowing that a lot of exercise equipment is hard to even obtain um, from an ordering standpoint, people aren't able to exercise, get, you know, buy exercise bikes at this point because um, the supply has been um, really challenging. Um, as far as um, the, oh, so yes, that's very good too, is the exercise um, guide for my tank dystrophy that we worked on at, um, at the beginning of the pandemic as well um, are posted in the files tab of the session, which is great. And um, if we were to re, uh, redistribute the um, survey via REDCap, um, it would be, uh, we would um, certainly ask the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation to help support us again in distributing it. So it, I would say just be on a lookout for any, um, anything that's COVID related survey um, from them. I don't see any more questions at this moment. Um, but yeah, I just, I just thought that your study was really interesting, Katie. It was very neat to see a lot of the parallels happen. Yes. Especially around faith and just getting out and exercising or connecting with nature and things like that. Yep, absolutely. I, I do think it was nice to see that our studies um, did correlate that well. Are there other resources that people with rare diseases should be accessing? Um, I would definitely recommend checking out the MDF uh, website for more of those guides and information. Um, there's also some of the larger um, rare disease umbrella groups that can have really useful information. It's like specific to COVID too. So look at NORD, look at Global Genes. Um, they have both released information about that. And they also have some, uh, at least NORD does, has some uh, financial small grants available for people who are struggling during COVID. Uh, so that could also be a good support. And I would also think about things like um, where we met, mentioned meditation. So, you know, there's lots of resources, um, you know, apps and things like that, um, that can be used to to support more specific um, things. Right, it'd be interesting to see how economics fits into these studies. I don't know about you, Katie, but I did collect information about income and socioeconomic status, and we haven't been able to formally analyze that yet, but I think it, it plays a huge role, as we've been seeing in the news, just in terms of uh, whether you're able to socially distance and get quality medical care and, and things like that. Right. No, we did not collect as much um, information in that area. And I think that is, um, again, really important because I think um, it has impacted how people have been able to um, manage during the COVID pandemic. 
So there's a question about getting on the email list for uh, future surveys. Uh, it sounds like the MDF can connect you with that. Right. Yes, that's an interesting comment. Um, and participant was saying that they felt that their their um, answers were very close to other people's or the overall data that we um, presented. And then there's a question there, Kathleen. Can I post uh, my info about how to get in touch with me and the survey? Um, sure. Maybe. Do you think I should just share screen share it? Again? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so while Kathleen's pulling that up, um, there was just another comment that, you know, economics may play um, a role in why older people are reporting less stress, and, and I would agree with that. Um, general public, there are studies showing that, uh, I lost my chat there, um, the general public that um, employment and um, job security is, is a little bit more challenging for um, the younger population than the older population. And there was also a comment um, regarding the um, University of Rochester patient registry um, was also a registry that was used to distribute the um, survey and would we would use that again as well. Um, but it's the um, my time to be uh, registry dot org. We also have a booth. Um, the University of Rochester has an exhibitor booth that you can get information about the registry as well. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, everyone.